I first moved to Mosvin in 1986. I was in my early 20s, but I had a passionate love affair with it well before then. I used to visit Mosvin about the age of nine or 10 with my favorite aunt, Kelly. We'd come across on the ferry from Circular Quay and we'd have lunch with Cliff and Lillian Doan. So I knew from about the age of 10 that I would one day live in this community. I just fell in love with it. I just thought what a great place to grow up. I was determined. Yeah, I was just so determined to live here. And I can remember when I bought my house in 1986, we paid 281000 for it and the interest rates were 21%. You can imagine the horror my parents experienced at uh, the thought of their daughter committing to that in her early 20s. Um, but that's how determined we were. And we live there still. Um, I'm grateful for that opportunity uh, to have raised my three children here. Yeah. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience and so giving something back uh, pays a bit of homage to that. Mm. Uh, that, that feeling that you know you are, I'm very grateful for being uh, living here. For me it was a combination of things. It was the knowledge that it was or had become the birthplace of scouting in Australia that really um, inspired me to, to move forward and do it because I could see I had a great interest in and have a great interest in youth development and leadership and I thought I could if I was able to bring this home I could not only restore the last remaining piece of early colonial maritime architecture in Sydney from the whaling period but I could dust off the birthplace of scouting and bring it back into the light so for me it was more than just the building I commissioned an archaeological investigation of the site and we found no evidence of Aboriginality but still remains for me a part of the project that is incomplete because we've never pursued and we'd like to pursue the interpretation of place to include the Aboriginal story of uh, uh, the last Camaragal person from that region. Unfortunately his European nickname was Tarpot and we don't know anything about him and that's a real shame. And I don't know that we will ever really know anything about him, but I think there's going to come a time in the very near future where we commission an interpretation and we erect storyboards at that site so that the early colonialism is, um, is uh, displayed alongside the original inhabitants out of respect because so many of our local students uh, visit this as a part of their local studies guide, um, our, their program in their local schools and they're not seeing the full picture and I'd like them to see the full picture. But the last sighting of um, Tarpot was in 1888 and uh, the Metro are a little unsure as to how much time he spent there because of the location of the original cave being very high up the cliff. I think the barn is the heart of Mossman because if you consider back in those days how we were living in sort of semi-rural conditions. The barn was a meeting place. It was one of those few facilities where everyone could come together and meet. It was before the local council and any sort of um, public facility where groups of people could gather and uh, discuss the important issues of the day. So that meeting was in December 1891 and then two years later on the 6th of June uh, 1893 it was used as the first polling booth uh, in the Mossman community. So yeah, I think, I think it is the heart of Mossman. In 1925, the last official photograph was commissioned by council before the demolition. It went into the paper and there was a huge public outcry. Uh, the community was not ready to let this go, even though it was in such poor repair. Um, the local scouts launched a campaign, saved the oldest building for the oldest troop, and went about fundraising the money required. Now. From my research, I've discovered that a number of families from the first Mossman 1908 scout group mortgaged their homes, signed, had signed bills, um, loans uh, to buy this property. So for me, it became, once I understood that, it became a personal challenge to honour that legacy of the original gift. So it took about three years after that before they fundraised the money required to restore her. Uh, and, and it's still the scout, birthplace of scouting in Australia now. It was known as the place to be on a Saturday night and those dances were actually uh, hosted by that local scout group as a fundraising uh, activity and people would come from all over Sydney. In fact, it was famous uh, amongst US personnel uh, as being the only Dixieland venue for music in Sydney 
And many of the musicians in their 80s and 90s now tell me that if you hadn't played the barn, you hadn't played. Um, the scouts, the old scouts tell me stories about when they were young cubs and uh, the way of polishing the um, parquet tray flooring was to put oil on a hessian sack and then sit a little scout on it and then drag them around by the legs. It was the way that they used to polish the floors before the Saturday night dances. But yeah, even, even before that, sort of the 1920s, late 20s, it was used as a ballroom. It was a way of promoting Mossman as a community um, uh, for people to, to uh, consider settling in uh, and attracting visitors. Uh, it was used as a ballroom on a Saturday night. So it's had a great history for uh, entertainment, if you like. I stood silent witness to the problems at the barn, I must confess, for more than 10 years before I moved forward. Like many locals, I saw it as um, being really significant, but somebody else's problem. Uh, I couldn't imagine that a building so historic would be allowed to, be, uh, in, to continue in such disrepair without somebody like the National Trust or the New South Wales Heritage Office or Council stepping forward. And then one night after being in the city and catching the ferry home late at night, I, it was torrential rain, I do remember, going into the barn just to check uh, that everything was okay and being ankle deep in water. And it was about midnight and I just made a, uh, I made a promise to the building at that point that I would do whatever it took uh, to protect it and restore it. And that in fact it wasn't somebody else's problem, it was our problem and it was about time we all got together and did something about it. So. That was really, for me, the turning point in about the year 2000 uh, to start doing something about it. In uh, September 2001, uh, we launched a community SOS uh, to the wider community uh, in full knowledge that in identifying its risk that we were uh, putting ourselves in danger. Um, because when you identify the amount of damage and risk to the property, you make it very, you make it more vulnerable. And in fact, uh, developers swarmed us uh, at that time. And I really have to give credit and thanks to, this, to the New South Wales Scout Association for trusting me to bring it home. Because at any time they could have sold it uh, and gotten rid of it and uh, made a lot of money on it. Because even at its worst, it was worth millions. Um, but they didn't, they, they trusted me to bring it home. And it took, uh, it took five years of fundraising to bring it home. Um, so it was, there was blood in the water down at Mossman Bay when we announced uh, the true condition of the site. Um, and as the deeper into the investigative works we went, the greater the problem became. Because it was in the geotechnical reports that we realised that the slope behind the building was, risk, was as high risk as Threadbow. And uh, that's when the insurers and Scouts Australia ordered us off the site, off the premises. And it really had to come to that uh, in order to bring it forward. So after that, it was just a journey of lobbying the Prime Minister, um, engaging uh, Tony Abbott and uh, Gillian Skinner, uh, who did a lot of good for us during that time, uh, and really just interacting with the community and running and hosting um, fundraising events to bring it forward. I had, um, I had a lot of uh, opposition, in fact. Uh, I had a lot of people criticise uh, my actions in, in uh, trying to do this restoration project because I was uh, seriously out of my league, I was told on several, several occasions, because I don't come from a, uh, an architectural background or an engineering background, which is probably a good thing because uh, ignorance is bliss. And when you don't know what you're faced with and you really, you, you're unaware of the risk, you just, you just jump in. Um, because you know it's the right thing. So uh, for me, it was all about passion. And uh, you know, a lot of people said that we should give it up, <clears throat> that we were in fact not in a position to, and if the scouting movement couldn't uh, fund it, then they should be made to give it up. But what you're saying when you say that is that youth and development uh, and heritage in this country, one cannot prop up the other. That in fact, if you allow that to happen, you're sending a very clear message that you don't value either. So it was about valuing both and, uh, and moving forward. So, and you know, having said that about that little bit of criticism, um, overwhelming community support. I made friends on that project that I consider to be family now. And, uh, you know, and I would have been lost without them because there were moments when uh, in the process of the discovery, we realised that uh, the, the, the work on the slope for behind the building, for example, was going to cost $748,000. Uh, that there were times when it felt like the air was sucked out of the room 
you know, where was that money going to come from? Where was that help going to come from? But, you know, having committed to it, the only way forward was forward. So, yeah, there were very hard times uh, during the course of that. Uh, in the beginning, I persuaded everyone that I could bring this home in a year. And uh, very quickly, I realised that that wasn't going to happen. Um, so it was really for me about the personal commitment to bringing it home. And when you really commit to something that is as problematic as that restoration project was, you have to accept that it's a, a process of pacing yourself, of knowing that you will have small victories along the way, but ultimately it's committing to whatever it takes to bring it home, not to a time frame because you cannot predict how the public will respond, um, you cannot predict uh, how the scope of works will progress, um, if there is help, where that help will come from, because really it's about, on a day-to-day -day basis, just inching forward day by day. It's important to acknowledge the contribution of Mossman Council through this process. Uh, from the very beginning, they were on board uh, for this project. Uh, the fact that we have a conservation management plan in place is thanks to Mossman Council and Gordon Mackay Logan, our heritage consultants. Mossman Council contributed $20,000 to that, uh, and also $5,000 to the um, investigative works at that time I was funding myself. And but more importantly, the staff came on board. Planning and Development and Heritage gave countless hours uh, of consultation to me personally and support uh, through the process of um, this long restoration. You know, I can imagine even after donor fatigue set in, the council staff were still engaged and still concerned and still could see what I could see, that this was worth bringing home. This is the last official photograph commissioned by Mossman Council prior to the demolition of the barn in 1925 and it's the actual photograph that caused the public outcry uh, to save the barn. Um, it spurred the local scout group, First Mossman, into action and they launched an appeal titled Save the Oldest Building for the Oldest Troop and raised the £443 that was required to purchase the building from Mossman Council and begin the restoration project. Even way back then, you know, they, they were looking for a new clubhouse. It just seemed to be such a terrible waste. Uh, and I think a lot of the older residents still had very fond memories of the balls and dances here in the 1930s, 40s and 50s. So it was, I think it was that grassroots movement that actually did save the building from demolition. Well, yes, we were very fortunate enough in our project to come across the author Eleanor Whitcomb. Eleanor Whitcomb wrote um, the first, was commissioned to write the first piece of children's literature in this country, specifically designed for Australian children. The Prime Minister of the day, Ben Chifley, had had. Um, was a little, grown a little tired of all the fairies and goblins of English literature and he wanted something that reflected the early colonial beginnings of this country. So he commissioned uh, Eleanor to write uh, a play or something that would um, uh, encapsulate those early uh, humble beginnings and Eleanor wrote uh, Pirates at the Barn, Smugglers Beware. Uh, it has a shared use, actually, the barn. Uh, scouts meet once a week and we hold uh, various events on weekends, but it also is home to a number of local community groups. Uh, we have uh, ballet, children's ballet, uh, uh, Dutch school on a Friday, uh, ladies Pilates, yoga, the Mossman Evening College um, run salsa dancing classes here, and uh, it just has a wonderful um, variety of uses. These are the whale bones that used to be uh, at the front of the building. Uh, they were authenticated by a member of the Australian Museum. They're actually the jaw bones of a humpback whale that they believe was harvested in this local area. And uh, during the restoration project, about 1927-28, the scouts erected them and they sort of arched over the front doorway. And many of the local residents remember them from that period in time and certainly some of the paintings from that era um, show them in the actual painting. So one of the projects we'd like to do in the future is to uh, somehow restore them um, with fibreglass or something, that protective coating and put them back on the outside of the building again. But I think if you celebrate, the greatest challenge for the barn in the restoration was choosing a period in time to restore it to. Yeah. When, you, when you decide that, Colleen, lock on, I said, I think that's a really big decision, you know. I guess for me, 
I'll have to, to, to dedicate it to the movement because it's here because of them. Um, so that's what I did was yeah. then to dedicate it to the movement um, of that time. So that hence the be prepared and the promise and whatever. So when kids come here, they get a sense of place. Mm 